Coniston Water in 1967. His widow, Tonya, and his only child, Gina. But he was a great man, and he did what he liked doing this. You see the films, you see photographs, and somehow it's happened to somebody else. It hasn't happened to you, it hasn't happened. As he accelerated to 300 miles an hour, attempting to smash his own record, disaster struck. Bluebird and the body of Donald Campbell were lost in the hidden depths of the lake. Some months after Donald died in the crash, I've been fascinated by Donald Campbell and Bluebird for something like 15 years and I've been absolutely determined to find this wreck. It's become something of a, a personal obsession. This is the epic tale of amateur diver Bill Smith's struggle to recover Bluebird and lay a ghost to rest. Campbell was the British hero of his time. Capturing both land and water speed records in the same year, the only man ever to do so. And everything he did, he said he did for his country. Most important of all, it still proves British leadership in engineering terms. And it does, I think, also show that the British, when they make their minds up, can jolly well overcome all obstacles and achieve anything. He broke eight speed records in nine years, a man of enormous courage and determination. Donald was a larger-than-life character. He was an exciting man, man full of personality, temperament, charisma. I hate that word, charisma, but he just oozed it. His boat also had an aura of excitement. Just before he shut off, there was that enormous wash behind it, and there was like a power, it was like a sensuous thing. And then, wow, you know? It was so exciting. It really, it was sexy, it was so exciting. Royal Navy divers searched a long while after the crash for Donald, but Tonya, his widow, never wanted his body found. I don't want him to be found, uh, not like this. He was so handsome and dignified and elegant. I don't want something in, in a bag. I don't. Neither did she want the bluebird salvaged. I wanted it. I wanted it down there with him. But Donald Campbell's only child, a daughter from an earlier marriage, disagrees with her stepmother and regrets she hasn't been able to bury her father. I still have not totally told myself that this event is all over. And here we are, 34, 33 and a half, 34 years later. And to me, the event is not quite over. Maybe that might change. Four years ago, Bill Smith, when he made his decision to begin his epic search, had yet to meet either woman. First, he needed to work out if he could even find the wreck. Owner of a Newcastle engineering factory, Bill could afford all the sophisticated magnetic and sonar equipment he needed. But finding Bluebird will be a lot harder than he imagined. Coniston Water is nine kilometers long and nearly a kilometer wide. No one knew for sure where Bluebird was or whether she had sunk in the mud to be lost forever. Coniston Water is also 40 meters deep. It's cold and impenetrably dark. At this depth, every dive has to be done slowly for fear of the bends or oxygen starvation. If you panic, you're probably going to die. Um, if, you, if you're in a situation that's going to cause you to panic, then you've got more to worry about than, than the panic itself. And it, it really is not an option. Bill and his companions take painstaking care with their equipment knowing that death or serious injury could occur without warning. For four years, with his two diving partners, 
Bill scoured the lake bed, diving on targets as diverse as tractor wheels and rocks, and found nothing. They studied old black and white newsreel of the crash again and again. Bill and his friends Paul and Alan scrutinized every frame for clues where Bluebird was. Oops. See there, that line. Mm -hmm. That's where it, there. See, it stops being rocks and starts yeah. being black. And then there's just here, just the front of the boat. Yeah? Mm -hmm. That's the same boat that he passed on the way down. This, this bit here is the bit that's black. It's between the safety boat and the rocks. So the boat just goes airborne there's there. The crag, uh, there's the crags, yeah. Yeah, we've got the craggy bit, and then it turns black. So if we say that the wreck cannot be further south of that line, it can't be south of there, yeah? Yeah. It's got to be that side be. of that line. But even this narrowing down of the target area left a very large stretch of lake to search in. Finally, in October 2000, when Bill was thinking of throwing in the towel, a striking image appeared on the sonar screen. What is that? Oh, oh, hang on, that's good. It's, uh, it's man-made. Some more? Uh, oh, hang on, I better get a position for this. Hang on. Look at all that. Dear me. It's a very large object with a trail of smaller ones behind it. Oh, hang on. And more. They had never seen anything like this in Coniston before. And Bill believes it can't be anything other than Bluebird. Only a dive could confirm whether Bill has at last located the lost Bluebird. It was a tense moment for Bill. I could see absolutely nothing because just to make matters worse, I was nervous about diving an unknown target anyway. There's always that, you know, that, that although you're excited, there's always a little bit of apprehension. Um, and I did the last part of the dive completely solo. And I, I looked around, as far as I could see, the limit of those lights and couldn't see anything at all. And I turned round, and there was the top of the air intake. And I looked at this, and it took a few seconds for the enormity of it actually to sink in. I looked, and I could, I was actually there, and I could see the damaged top of the wreck, and I could see blue paint. It took a little while to actually sink in the fact that here it was. And I had a hold of it. The object of the exercise for four years, and I had a hold of it, and that, that wouldn't register for a while. And I turned round, and I, I swam to the back of the boat, and there was the tail fin, still standing, still solid, attached to the fuselage. And I just went up to the side of the tail fin, and very carefully, so as not to damage it, I just very carefully wiped the muck off the Union Jack on the side of the tail. There it was, still flying the flag, 34 years in the water, and still with the Union Jack on the side of the tail. And I, I was absolutely elated. It was fabulous. Bill is elated at seeing Bluebird after such a long time. The endless days in the cold and rain were finally justified. Bill thought the story was over, but he had awakened old memories. Memories of a tragic day that was still shrouded in mystery. Paul Evans was Donald's radio operator. First thing in the morning on uh, January the 4th, um, told him the water conditions were fine. Everybody started to assemble. He actually started the run at 8.47. Uh, in the morning, and um, from that point, everything uh, went fine. Uh, from the start up to uh, getting onto full house and going through the first measured mile. Robbie Robinson worked in the safety boat for every run. Just watching the boat go by, it was so fast that the, it was quite difficult, but it was right opposite you for the eye to follow it. I mean, I'd seen it so many times that you become a bit blase about I mean to this to the extent that you simply didn't expect that what did happen was ever going to happen you know it came as a 
complete not a shot. Well, it's, it, I mean, it's not often you see um, grown men crying. Uh, and there was a lot of that done that day. Donald Campbell's death was particularly tragic for his only daughter, Gina, and it's remained unbearable ever since. Last November, she received a phone call. Bill rang me, and this voice says, Gina, hello, it's Bill Smith. I found it, I found it, I found it. I found the bluebird. I think I'm really rather pleased. She set off to Coniston to meet Bill Smith. So the obvious question is, no sign of father? Well, the question is, would you like there to be a sign? Because it's doable. I mean, we, we can map the debris field bit by bit by bit, and we can dive every fragment in the debris field. And to be perfectly honest, if we couldn't find some evidence of what happened, or we couldn't find personal items, I'd be very, very surprised. Bill takes Gina on her first trip on the lake. It becomes an unexpected journey into the past. You broke a record on my birthday yeah. on this lake. 19th of September. I think it was 56 or 57. And I remember there was a BBC crew there and they came rushing up to me live. And I'm only a little tot. Gina, Gina, this must be the very, very best birthday present you could possibly wish for. I said, oh no, I want a pony. <laughs> <laughs> I got a pony. Yeah, oh, that's fair. Enough. Eventually. Most girls are. <laughs> and you know, I've never ever really believed it. Probably until now, that ever really happened. You see the films, you see photographs, and somehow it's happened to somebody else. It hasn't happened to you, it hasn't happened to him. But it did. I'm glad you found it. I'm pleased. It's made it upset you. I'm glad you found it. It's, it's given us a lot of. Uh, we've had a lot of, a lot of pleasure from. Without Don't. people like yourself, my father's name will die, and it's most important it doesn't die. It's most important that it stays in people's minds and they remember what he did. Pretty go for second place to spend the rest of your... You better find him. OK. You wouldn't like to spend the rest of eternity down there, no, would you? No, I don't you? think I would either. As Gina returns to the shore, the fate of Bluebird becomes an obvious concern. What will happen to the boat? You found it. Somebody's going to bring it up one day. My big concern about the wreck is that, you know, we've proven that it's possible to do it now. I mean, that the sort of equipment that you need to do it is now available to the private individual. And it's not commonplace, but it's, it's doable. And yeah. we found it, which means someone else can find else. it. But somebody else might just come the hacksaw and start taking bits. That's my worry. Gina and Bill agree to raise the boat. Although Bill has identified the boat itself, there has been no sign of her father. But there's a trail of smaller objects behind the main wreck, and the sonar images show what could be the remains of Donald Campbell. Right, we've got the big image on the screen, and that big image is highlighted in the red box uh, on the right-hand side of the screen. And what we're looking at there is what would take to be a head, which is spherical in shape. 
then we've got a neck and then we have a right shoulder Sonar images are notoriously hard to interpret. Like finding the wreck of Bluebird, the only sure way to confirm a hunch is by diving. He invites Brian Gilgis, a highly regarded commercial diver, Graham Woodfine, and Carl Spencer to assist in the dive to identify the target. That's the target, that's the thing we're trying to get to. That's the thing we want to get a diver on, get it identified. And this is our target that we've put in, which is attached to a line to the surface. And now what we're trying to do is to get the support boat to pick this up and move it very carefully until it paints out that target. Once we've done that, we know the diver can drop straight on it. Boat, so I've got further to face something down. That's it. Yeah, they're on it now. They're on it. Whatever it is, they've got it. They're definitely visual now. Oh, that's it. That's it. They're on it. There he's down. Nothing in that spot. Nothing. Uh, Meets are too round it. Next to it, there's a bunch of weed with an aluminium rod in it, sticking out at 45 degrees. Other than that, I can't see anything. It wasn't Donald's body. Bill decides the only way forward is to inspect every target in the trail of wreckage behind Bluebird. There are a lot of pieces lying out on the lake bed, scattered around in a, a fairly well-defined area that were smashed off the boat in the accident. We need to systematically move around them and examine every single piece. And of course, there's one piece down there um, that, uh, that is of particular interest because Donald definitely went into the lake and he definitely didn't come out. And somewhere, not very far away, um, is, is Donald or evidence of what became of him. In January, Bill returns with a new piece of equipment. Cute, isn't it? Little swimming camera. Little thrusters on the back. The thruster in the top. And a little baby camera in the front. It's an ROV or remotely operated vehicle. They can use the camera to visually identify objects on the lake bed without sending down a diver. Well, that's a bit of wreckage here in amongst there, it has to be. That's not loose tumbleweed, what you found there? They found something that needs further investigation. A diver is sent to bring it up. Check it ahead, Paul. Check it ahead. Yeah, we're all right. We're safe now. Oh, it's a big chunk, this one. Oh, this is well heavy. We're going to have to go back into the shore, me thinks.
from the bulkhead almost to the nose. There's the remains of the seat fabric. It's part of the cockpit pattern. That is a that's a big piece. It's a good bit to have. As the search for the body continues, Bill painstakingly assembles the pieces of debris in his Newcastle factory. He thinks they can answer some questions about the crash. The mystery that surrounded this thing since it crashed is what happened to Donald Campbell. And now we've got the piece that he was sat in, it might give up a few clues. He calls in accident investigator Steve Moss for some unofficial advice. This is a, um, a map, a rough one, of the... Uh, of the actual distribution of, of the debris. Uh, on the from, seabed? Yeah, on the leg bed. Done from your sonar? Um, yes, it's, yeah. yeah, it's mainly sonar information. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that, that's the main yeah. section from yeah. the cockpit to the tail. Is it lying upright? It's upright, yeah. yeah. It's on its keel. It's, it's very seldom, certainly in, in airplane accidents, where you get a wreckage trail like this, mm -hmm. that everything adds up. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always the one piece or two pieces that you say, well, how did they get there? Mm -hmm. um, but looking at this generally, I would say it's pretty consistent um, uh, with the heaviest part, that main spar really is heavy, mm -hmm. being thrown furthest distance. This is a heavy piece, but it's got you know, a fair bit of, of drag. It's quite mm -hmm. a large piece, um, is the next one. Uh, and here is the light stuff pointing to a, an impact somewhere around about here. Mm -hmm. And what they decide is the Bluebird did not hit the water head on. The cockpit was hit by a massive sideways blow. This might be the reason why Donald Campbell's body isn't anywhere near the main wreck. Somehow that, that's where the spray deflector is, something in that direction, and it's come forward and met the, uh, it's crushed the spar in, that, the spar. in that direction. Yeah. Bill is keen to continue his search slowly and painstakingly, but in February his plans are thwarted as the story leaks and news of his discovery is splashed over the Sunday papers. Campbell's feud over Bluebird wreck. The wreck of Bluebird, the jet-powered boat on which Donald Campbell died while trying to break the world water speed record in 1967, has been found by a It means a change of plan. He decides to postpone his search for the body and recover the main part of the wreck fast. It is a very dangerous dive site, and, you know, people would attempt to do it who perhaps shouldn't, and there could be, you know... There could be serious safety issues. And the other thing, of course, is that Gina, you know, whose father was killed in the boat, wants us to look for our father's remains and wants us to, to preserve the wreck. But Donald's widow, Tonya, had never wanted the wreck disturbed. When, when this started to happen, I called a friend of ours and I said, is there any legal way that I can stop ever having that boat out. And he said there might be a legal way to stop it till your death, but after that, there isn't. And then I thought, well, better the devil you know than the devil you don't know. If it's got to happen, I want to be there just in case. I want everything treated with as much respect as possible. The family wanted it up, and I didn't want a fight. I, I am in good relation with them. I didn't want to fight. It's March the 8th. The Lake District National Park have given them just four days to move the wreck because of the fear of spreading foot and mouth. A huge team is assembled. A barge has been shipped in and what started as Bill's private obsession is now a huge recovery operation. Bill and Brian Gilgis, the commercial diver, are worried about the problems of lifting the wreck. They know they can't make any mistakes, even though they have to do it in half the time they want it. The problems that I can foresee, if there are going to be any, is the depth that it's in the mud. Uh, it's going to require a lot more lift to get the suction broken. Also, the fact that it did crash at 300 miles an hour, we don't know what the weak spots are. You the... could end up with a nasty situation where if you get a failure at the front on the spar, yeah. the whole thing rolls over and takes the tail out on the back. That's a fair one, yeah. So we have to be very careful. The barge moves out to the wreck site three kilometres from the pier.
the barge is needed to support the one and a half ton weight of the wreck when it is finally lifted from the lake bed. Neither Bill or Brian want the concrete anchors to damage any of the wreckage, so the barge must be moored accurately above Bluebird. If you drop one there, then we'll walk one over this way somewhere that you're going to set up organised. Yeah, but if you've got two on that side, you're going to end up with three on that side. No, no, we've got one. We've got one there, and one there. They must work together on this job, but both are used to being the boss. Trust me. Bill dives in with Zadie, one of the professional divers. Descending 40 meters to the gloomy depths of the lake, their first task is to secure two yellow straps to a spar that sticks out from the front of the wreck. They are vital. Without them, tying the front of the wreck to the lifting frames will take more time. Brian monitors the operation on the remote camera. Down to one, are you okay, over? Perfect, perfect. Did you manage to get them on? Yes. Nice one. <laughs> All ready for tomorrow, yeah? It's already the second day. Today, they need to fasten a metal frame at the end of a 40-meter rope to the straps on the wreck. They're going to raise the front of the boat clear of the mud, but they don't know if the structure is strong enough to withstand the strain of being lifted. If the front spar rips out, it'll be a disaster. Start to move. Keep going. Start moving again, mate. That's good. That's a bunch of movement there. That's it. First time in 34 years she's on the move. Right. Keep it coming nice and slow. Easy, easy. Oh, yes, it's oh, over. It's out, it's out. Wow. It's out. It's the front of Bluebird is now hanging free of the lake bed, but the ROV pictures show that the cockpit floor has been burst out in the crash. Bill is alarmed. Their plans to attach extra safety straps could be dangerous for the divers, and he doesn't want to do it. See what I mean about trying to sweep a strap under there? It's all burst down over. The bottom end of the cockpit is bent down almost to the mud level. I would drop this whole idea of putting that strap on there. Yeah, I think so. Why? Oh, because, because it's adding complication and we don't need it. Yeah. It's not adding complication. It is adding complication. Adding safety. We're safety making, wise, let's get the strap on. Safety wise, we're yeah, making right. dives that we don't need we're in not, 40 meters of water. We're not making dives. We, we are. Need. We don't need them. We are. We don't need that strap. You can't say that, Bill. We can say it. It You've hasn't not been even down, inspected it, or anything else. You can't just collapse it. Like even, it doesn't need it. It doesn't need it. It hasn't even cracked the paint on that spot. Yeah, but you can't go down. Just say, well, that doesn't need it. You need to go down and look at it. It's safer to get a strap well, I'll, on. Well, I'll go down and look at it, but we don't need the strap. It needs a strap underneath it. You've got, if you get the strop under there, it's there. Why are, we risking, no why are we risking people's lives to f out of that strop? We're when not risking people's lives. We are. No, we're not. Every time you go to the bottom of there, you're risking people's lives. Well, if that's the case, the whole project's risking your lives. Well, of course it is. So let's right. do it as little as we need to do. We don't let's need that strop. Let's make it safe. I'm not prepared to run a diving operation unless that strop's. Well, get your kit on. No. Nope. I've got lots to do it. They'll do it. Strop it. It's dangerous for no good reason. No Sorry, reason man. at all. I want it stropped. Strop it. The divers go in to fix the straps, and it takes the rest of the day. It's the morning of day three. They find that the heavy tail of Bluebird is stuck in the mud. Another lifting frame is lowered, 
and divers descend to fasten it to the straps that have been fixed to the stern. Not only is the back of the boat immersed one and a half meters in the mud, it's the heaviest part of the wreck. The lift begins. Bluebird won't budge. You know, I don't think he'll do it, man. No. The situation is that whereas the front pulled straight out of the mud, because it had landed tail first and settled gently, the front came straight back out. The back is about a metre under the mud, and it's not giving in quite as easily. Unable to move it, they resort to a lift bag. This is fixed to the rope and filled with air, giving it enough buoyancy to lift two tons. Gradually, the stern of Bluebird eases out. That's it, the biz is gone. She's out. Wait, why it's cleared? They put another lifting bag on the front of the boat. We've got the boat hanging about. Five meters there. off the lake bed. Is he on here now? Uh, on two bags. It's all exciting stuff. Bluebird is now floating five meters above the lake bed, suspended from the lifting bags. Throughout the day, she is lifted five meters at a time until she is just a few meters below the surface. The most difficult task is now ahead successfully towing Bluebird underwater into shore without damaging it. And there are some local people unhappy about the prospect. From my point of view, and I think the point of view of most local people, we're absolutely certain that it should be left there. It was where Donald was, uh, you know, it was what he was driving when he was killed. And you, the, the back of your mind is this horrible thought, you know, if you disturb it, what, what you might find. Time has nearly run out. It's the fourth day. And at 4 a.m., the team are still in the middle of the lake. We're going to go in backside first. When we get down there, if you can get yourself so you're ready to take the line off us and just hold her off while Richard gets himself sorted with a barge. What are you doing about navigation? That's what you're there for, mate. The bright light. <laughs> Red lights! <laughs> Happy Today days. Day. <laughs> Through the early hours, Bluebird is inched closer to the shore, three kilometres away. As dawn breaks, the world's press start assembling. At eight in the morning, Bluebird is still a kilometre out. The barge leaves to moor closer to the shore, while Predator takes up the tow. When we get in, when the barge gets into position, we'll bring the boat between the jetties. If you can fire up the ROV and get it in the water, we need a survey of the lake bed before the back bags are deflated. In case there's any rocks under the hull. The barge secures itself on retracting legs. At 10 a.m., Bluebird finally reaches a point 50 meters from the shore. Absolutely perfect. On the jetty, Donald's widow, Tonya, has arrived. This is history. Then a problem. Bluebird is suspended from the massive lift bags 
and the water is too shallow for Bluebird to get closer to the shore. But it's still too deep for the trailer on which it will be winched onto dry land. What we're gonna do now is get all this superfluous rigging off and we're gonna lay her down gently. We're gonna rig the hoses to it, yeah. lay her down gently, let the bags deflate themselves as she goes down. And uh, when she's on the bottom, we're gonna start rigging the lift bags to the bluebird itself. How much water have we got? Another five, five and a half meters. And we're on a she, the nose is on a slope, the arse ends floating free. We've got five meters below here. Yes, below the hole. Five meters of water. No, yeah. she's, she's, she's on the bottom. She's on the bottom, yeah. She's on the bottom at the bows. Yeah. They decide to lower Bluebird back to the lake bed and shorten the ropes to getting closer. Stand by, Zed, stand by. Uh -huh. Right, what's happening? He's telling you, he did stuff on the boat. Right, where is that rope coming down from the surface? Are you telling me that goes under the boat, over? But the lake bed isn't as level as they expected. She's over to the port side quite a bit, right. and she's lying bows up. Right. So what we intend to do is inflate very slightly on the port bow. Just to level it. Yeah, and very slightly on the port stern. stern. Yeah. OK? Are we excited? Are we just? Are we ever? They attach the new lifting bags. But as they start to inflate them, something goes wrong. Right. Whoa! Who's turning that compressor on? I don't know. Hey, that one's on. Oi, hey, hey, that one's on. Get that fucking compressor off. Who turned that on, mate? I did. I'm sad, mate. Ryan. Let's get this sorted, though, first. That comes up where it is and you push the tail on the other side of the boat. It won't. Trust me, it's not going to happen. It did before. It's not gonna happen. It did once. It's not happening now, right? Trust me. It's not gonna happen. Bluebird, we've tried partially lifting her, and she's slipped backwards, and she's now got the stern under the barge. So we're going to relocate the barge and start lifting again. You can't move the barge at the moment, Brian. Why not? You have to lift the legs, and we need to extend the crane to do that. Do you wanna, um... Yeah, but you need to give us a, a bit of notice. No worries. Not in a hurry. I mean, this isn't a hurry. Get it nice and slow, we'll get it out. Seeing as the, seeing as the bow is out here, nearly clear anyway, yeah. and the back end is the end that's going to potentially suffer the worst damage because yeah. it's got the rudder and the fin, yeah. why don't we get a hold of the back end and pull the back end out? You'll, you'll dig in. You'll turn. She's at 30 degrees like that. You'll turn. Then you're going to drag the back. No, we're going to drag the back. We're going to swing her out. Yeah, no, what if, you, what if you, you've got a rudder and a stabilising fin yep. stuck in the bottom? You don't know whether they're stuck through rock, you don't know what they're stuck in there. If you swing it around on them, in. you'll burst one off. If you want me to lift that with a crane from underneath there, you must accept the risk that you will damage, or you may damage the fin. Are you happy? Well, we're either going to damage the fin or damage the rudders. That's your call. So I think the best thing to do is to move the barge. OK. Because the problem is not the boat or the bags, the problem is the barge. Exactly. Right, can you move the barge for us in your own time, Richard? The barge is moved away from Bluebird. Bags are inflated again. Holy shit, this is one of the bags. Where's the other two bags? Let's stand by, lads. Just the foot. At the top of the tail. Drums. 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 Drums.
need to bring it around this side, and we'll pull on those hoses and bring them around. That is awesome. That's absolutely awesome. I don't believe it. Anxious to see what is being revealed, Tonya goes out to the barge. OK, let's get this diver out of the water, lads. Oh, my God. We brought her back. You brought her back. The bird is back. <laughs> She's kept well. Yeah. She's fabulous. Where's the cockpit? Right there. Yeah, right it? there. Is the cockpit broken open? It's just gone. Yeah, it's just it's as if it was yeah, just he's chopped. Out of it. Oh, he's not in there. There she is. Incredible. And I let it come out because, you know, it's no good keeping it in. That's bad for you. But it's hurting. And then I want to disconnect the hoses, get the hoses free. Think Donald would have enjoyed all this? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's unbelievable after 34 years. It's unbelievable. It's a moment of great triumph and sadness. For Robbie, with Donald the day he died, the memories are overwhelming. For Tonya, the past too has returned. I hurt terribly. It all came back to me. It all came back to me. It was like it happened yesterday. The pain of that, those two years after the crash were the most miserable years of my life. that we dragged it up into this world, I was actually quite horrified. I and mean, the first thought was, you know, put it back. It shouldn't be here. But we knew that we'd effectively written a little bit of history or rewritten a little bit of history. And it, it, it was very, very real at that point. Gina Campbell returns home from Australia to see Bluebird again. She rushes to Newcastle where the wreck is being stored. What a brave man. What a brave man. It's that immense feeling of pride and respect for anybody. For anybody, and I mean anybody that will... ride in that thing. That thing. She was so beautiful the last time. Almost see, almost see, it's like Climbing there, looking so expectant. Smile. 
It's like a dream come nightmare, come surreal. It's surreal, isn't it? It's like a ghost. A real life ghost. It's come to the surface. You've done a good job. Thank you. But raising the wreckage of Bluebird isn't enough. Gina still wants to rescue the remains of her father from the bottom of the lake. And Bill is determined to help her do that. Over the next four weeks, he searches amongst the remaining pieces of wreckage for the body. And he continues to analyze the wreck of the boat. The final record attempt was stretching Bluebird and Donald Campbell to the limits. This is the terrible part about trying to break a record. You see, you once you start, you're past the point of no return. Bill has made one discovery. Donald Campbell had time to put his emergency water break on. Steve Moss, the accident investigator, returns. That looks as if it's been deployed as a last ditch effort to get out of trouble. Donald knew something was wrong long before the boat left the water, but it was too late. You wouldn't really think that he would apply the brakes. You, you, in your car, you wouldn't apply the brakes and still keep your foot on the accelerator. No, you, you, they would be both together, wouldn't it? And, and really, it's, perhaps he'd not really done it in that combination before, you know, of trying to do it that rapidly to slow down. The designer of Bluebird, Ken Norris, is convinced the up and down movement of the sponsons caused by the wake from Donald's first run lifted the nose of the boat. The information from the wreckage is also helping Bill to locate the body. It didn't land square on the water, which you would expect that it wouldn't. It wasn't until we tracked the wreckage back to the point of impact that we saw what had happened the actual damage to the cockpit, we could see where the spar had struck the other pieces of wreckage. And that was only possible because we recovered the wreckage and reassembled and examined it. That had never been done before. On the 26th of May, with Coniston water alive with sailboats, Bill sets off on one more dive. When we first saw a piece of blue fabric and we realized that we found him, we all had to go out on deck, uh, just, just to be outside and just you know, think about this. Um, very strange thing. It, it, I think perhaps we haven't really had time to fully assimilate it and, and make sense out of it. The following day, they go to recover the body. But lifting the remains of Donald Campbell will be very different from lifting a piece of wreckage. Because I can't decide whether to be upset or delighted. The, the contrast between the, the technical aspect of, of being able to achieve this and the teamwork and the fact that the enormity of, of pulling Donald Campbell out of Coniston, you know, very conflicting, very conflicting state of mind. Let's lift it straight to the bottom. Kick my head a little bit, Al. Underwater, they carefully place Donald Campbell's remains in a casket. Bill and his team now gently bring it to the surface. Then they have the delicate task of lifting it on board.
Gina Campbell and her husband wait on the jetty at Pier Cottage. It was from here, 34 years ago, that Donald Campbell set off for his final record attempt. place down there wasn't the right wasn't really the right thing you know once everything else had been moved it was only right and Gina can you know and Tony have been put him to rest properly now and I just thank everybody for being so respectful and kind and thoughtful and giving my father the dignity and the finality that he deserves <laughs> <laughs> 